This is KC Sports Network, proudly presented by M Prize Bank. What is up, Chiefs Kingdom? Welcome into a post AFC Championship edition of Twenty One Questions. Uh, I'm sitting down with Maddie Lane here at the East West Shrine Bowl, our final show from Dallas altogether. Oh, hey. Listen, I am refusing the urge to chew this cough drop that is in my mouth directly into this mic so people have to listen to me crunch away. We went to a Mavs game. We did. I made it my entire purpose there to cheer as loud as I could for the Mavs, potentially to upset Kent just a little bit. I did do that. Um, So my voice is on the fritz. We had a great time. East West Shrine has been absolutely phenomenal. We had a lot of fun down here. And I think, geez, they're going back to the Super Bowl. So that's kind of cool. Yeah, it's, it seems like a yearly tradition at this point where we go to the East West Shrine Bowl and then we come back with an AFC title. Like it's It's been two out of the last three years we've gone to the, to the East West Shrine Bowl. And this year it's in Dallas. Not a great place here for all the constant. If you guys are watching with us uh, during the game, after the game, you get to see our pretty pretty sick setup by the pool out back. But uh, it was nice. a little KCSN content house action going on. It was. We got to reenact a bunch of big plays from the Chiefs game in our yeah. backyard. That Legally. was... Yeah, we had, that is true. We got it. We got. We didn't have dots, but we had people. <laughs> so like, it was. It was pretty fun. Um. So yeah, we had. We had fun with the live stream. We had a lot of fun out here. This was a. This was a nice spot. Nice little get up. We had a lot of fun last year doing it in Vegas. A lot of fun this year. So, I guess the Chiefs just got to keep playing in AFC Championship games while we're covering the Shrine Bowl, and we can have fun. I guess so. I think that's what they have to do, and you know, I think I'll be okay with it, Matty. But this is twenty-one questions. We came here to answer your guys' questions from the ACSN Discord. If you don't know by now. This is how you can ask questions. You subscribe to the KCSN Substack, kcsn.substack.com. $30 a year, $5 a month to get written analysis from uh, guys like Maddie, Craig Stout, uh, Joseph Hefner, and also Kent Swanson. You also get his articles as well. So make sure, go check those out at, at kcsn.substack.com. That subscription gets you a link to come in and join the KCSN Discord. And in that KCSN Discord, we have a channel that is 421 questions. That's where we solicit our questions from and Maddie is going to be our asker of questions today, oh, Matthew. Let's go. Uh, which one do you want to start with today? Oh, we're well, starting with this one. This is for you. Okay. Oh, this is from okay. Kyle C. Who do you think is more responsible for this title run? B, Maddie picking the Buffalo Bills to win, or Josh Briscoe picking the Baltimore Ravens to win? Interesting. Well, I do think now that we have a trend, that somebody is going to have to pick the 49ers, right? Yeah. Can it? Can we double dip? Or does it have to be somebody new? What do you think? I think it has to be somebody new. Okay. I think it has to be somebody um, what's Dirk up to? Um, <laughs> I can see. Yeah, I don't think he'll do that. Um, I do think, Betty, though, I would say that you're the most responsible because the Bills game just naturally came first. You know, <laughs> it's I'm just going in chronological order here. Bills game came first, so I think that you would be the most responsible. Yeah, I mean, like I, I'm okay with that. I'll tell you, it seems like I caught a little bit more heat than than, yeah. than Josh has for picking the Ravens. I for when I picked the Bills, you know. Um, so yeah. That's okay. I, I I can wear the weight of this. Um, you guys, you don't want to attack me. Now you got to give me the praise, right? You want to keep coming at me saying I picked the bills. Now you just got to give me the credit. True. Got to give me the credit. It's true. All right. Um, we are moving on next. This is from uh, Mike Denny. What non-Patrick Mahomes player has the best chance to win the Super Bowl MVP? Oh, I, I, we've had this conversation, uh, and and I think you and I had it at actually at practice at the East West Shrine Bowl, and I said, you know, if Travis Kelsey has eleven catches four touchdowns because that breaks the touchdown record in like a 140 yards like you gotta i think you gotta give it to travis Kelsey at that point yeah i mean i think so i think he's the only guy right maybe right. chris jones could maybe and if chris jones has a huge game like maybe because he's the one guy on the defense that you could really see taking the game over and then having the dynamic plays the turnover sacks like stat sheet stuff that yeah. get there on the defensive side but offensively it's patrick Mahomes. The only option is Travis Kelsey, and it would have to be similar to kind of how the Ravens game went, where he has over half of Patrick Mahomes' uh, passing yards belong to him, or just about half. He has the touchdown, but he's got to do some of it in the fourth quarter. I think that would have been the issue with the way the Ravens game went. Yeah. He didn't do a lot in the fourth quarter. Like It'd be hard, though, and I think that's why he's like plus 6,000 to win the MVP. But still, I mean, like that's not a bad bet to take because he's got a... There's a lot of non-football momentum behind Travis Kelsey to be right. in the spotlight right now. Well, shout out to our guy, Nick Diaz, uh, producer at the uh, Blue Wire studio. Uh, Ooh, yeah. He hosts a Veterans Minimum podcast also on Blue Wire. He has he had said that if Travis Kelsey wins, because uh, he has a Travis Kelsey Super Bowl belt at in, uh, MVP, if he wins, he'll donate, uh, I think, half of it to 87 and running. 
So oh, unless awesome. those happen, uh, he did uh, put that out there. So uh, look, I'm not cheering for it. Love to see Travis Kelsey. Do that. Let's go. Next one from Arrow. Who throws the best spiral of the KCSN crew? Well, this is a loaded question. It's yeah. obviously Kent Swanson because he played quarterback kind of. Um, and so he does throw the best spiral. I think the more interesting conversation would be the second best. I think it's Tuck. I think Tuck's got the second best spiral. I can't throw a spiral to save my life. I can I can accurate. I can put the ball where I need to, but it, it's a it's a wobbler. The spiral I throw with my right hand is pretty good. I'm still working on my left hand spiral. It's it, guy. Both it, hands. It, yeah, it, so when I throw it, it's pretty like level right with my mm-hmm. right. But the left, for some reason, the tip wants to wander up. Mm. I don't know. Wandering tip. Yeah. Nobody clipped that. <laughs> Nobody clipped that. Um, it, it just like wants to wander up, so it flies like this. Um, but I appreciate the praise. I don't. I've never thought of myself about throwing a tight spiral. What I have thought about on tight spirals. A tight end coach they got at the East West Rival can Ooh. throw some tight spirals. She zips that thing in. She was slinging them. Yeah, they had some heat on them. They had some heat on them. Um, all right. Um, from Apes of Spades, will Trent McDuffie finish his career with more All Pros or more interceptions? Oh. <laughs> it, it, I, 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 logically, it has to be interceptions, right? Like, there's just right. logically, it has to be interceptions. You play defensive back. If you're going to continue to make all pros, eventually, you know, some years you're going to have to have the stats to back it up. And for defensive backs, that's going to be interceptions. But man, we got one already in the bank for the all pros. Yeah. The interceptions still aren't there. And it's just like, that's clearly not a huge part of his game. So I, I it might be closer than you would feel comfortable, but like it's got to be interceptions logically. <laughs> That's what I started thinking is like all pro already has an edge. It's it's crazy to think about that because uh, we were talking about we were watching the all twenty two last night, and it's crazy to think that like Trent McDuffie still does not have an interception in his career. It's I it know it's not part of his game. It's never really what he did at Washington. It's not really what he's done when he came into the league. Uh, but it's still kind of insane for how good he is not to have an interception. But it's going to be close. I'll, I'll lean interception just because of law of averages, I guess. You have more opportunities to get interceptions than get all pros. Um, but it's going to that's a that's a crazy that's it's crazy. It's not even a question. Right, you, you don't know? have to think about it. Right, because right? yeah. for any defensive back, you're like, oh, you you legit you literally it's only you're only allowed to get one all pro in a year, right? Like so, like you can't get more than one in every single season, <laughs> but you can have like, as many interceptions as you want. So yeah, I, huh. All right, we are moving on. Uh, Mike Denny's got another one here. Uh, do you have a favorite Super Bowl bet? Um, prop bet, sorry. A favorite Super Bowl prop bet of all time. Not necessarily this year, but just, oh, yeah, just of one in recent years that you've seen that you have thought has been kind of fun. I, I'm not a betting guy. It's not legal where I live. I just don't do it, so I don't know what they all are. I yeah. do remember when they had the, uh, I forget the band, but the guy was known for his uh, guitar arm swings or whatever, and you could bet how many he did in a row, I think, was Ooh. one one year. Was that the Strokes? When the Strokes did the Super Bowl halftime show? I don't really know. Yeah, I think there was one something like that for like how many, I don't even know what it's called, but yeah, like how many big arm swings on the guitar you could hit in a row. So like that's that's probably the one that sticks with me. Yeah, I always like the Gatorade color. The Gatorade color one is always, uh, is always a fun one to try to guess. But uh, they have always got the novelty props of DraftKings Sportsbook. They got the jersey number of who you think the first touchdown score will be over 22 and a half, which um, is interesting when you start to think about it. You think about all the good players, like Patrick Mahomes could have a rushing touchdown. He's 15. That would be under. There's a lot that are under. Debo's under. Ayuk's under. Rice is under. Pacheco's under. There's a lot of unders. Really, what's... It's George Kittle and Travis Kelsey kind of versus the field is almost what I think, Ron. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Travis Kelsey for a while, I think it was more last year than anything, was a really good bet for first touchdown score. Like Travis Kelsey scored a lot of first touchdowns. Uh, but that's always a fun one, too, is the jersey number, first touchdown score, or last touchdown score. You can do it for both. Um, but 22 and a half. It's a good line set by DraftKings. Oh, wait, is it 22 and a half? Okay, McCaffrey's 23, Three. right? Okay, so you it's him, George Kittle, and Travis Kelsey. That over looks good there. All right, from uh, B. Hicks, what do evenings look like in the KCS and Shrine Bowl frat house? That's a good way to put it. Um, you know, evenings are... So, like, last evening we went to the Mavs game. So that was a little bit different. But it's usually uh, we watched the Royal Rumble on Saturday. All got together, watched the Royal Rumble. Uh, Craig made some jambalaya. Well, that was really good. It was a credible jambalaya. And we uh, watched the Royal Rumble. I believe Kent called it Rumbalaya, which... Mm-hmm. I guess you got to give credit where credit's due. Sometimes. He won't listen to this, so yeah, that was a, it was a yeah, pretty good one. Yeah, he won't. We're good. 
Um, and so it's usually just a lot of uh, decompressing usually because our, our days are fairly busy when it comes to the Shrine Bowl. Um, we go practice in the mornings, then right into interviews with all yeah. these prospects. I think we got, shoot, what we do, 10 on Monday. So we got pretty close to, I think, uh, oh, well over 20 interviews. Yeah, I think we, I think total we probably got over 30 um, for different yeah. banks. Like yeah. we, it's a lot. It's really busy. So like I would say like the evenings are probably like as, as crazy as I guess somebody right. would think, yeah. right? Like um, it, it's more the evenings. Like if we have a free evening, people were pretty hyped up obviously during the Chiefs game and stuff. But like yeah. if we were hanging out here during that time before everybody started to get, you know, not even necessarily sleepy, just like a little tired, just like a little exhausted from the day. Get, there's a little bit more going on there. So it just all depends on what we're doing um, right. up and down. But like it's fun. We all have fun hanging out together and doing everything. And so we just kind of pick some different stuff to do. And there's, you know, yeah, there ends up being people watching uh film. We've watched, <laughs> we watched college film one night. Oh, late right. yeah, we did, like yeah. midnight. We watched the all 20, we watched a replay of the chiefs and <laughs> the Ravens. Then we watched the all 22 one night. It's like, we do a lot of just, you know, football nerd stuff too. That's right. Yeah. It was, it, I, that was right after the NFC championship game. We put back on the replay of the AFC championship game. Uh, yeah, no, we, we have watched a lot of film. All right. Um, Derek asks, are you concerned with the Chiefs' second half performance? What would you anticipate the 49ers doing on the defensive side of the Baltimore did so well? I think the last part, we, we'll get really deep into like what the Niners and Chiefs matchup will look like as we go on. I don't think just as a grand, you know, or just like an overlaying point here, I don't think the 49ers defense does a lot of the same stuff the Ravens do. They don't mix it up quite the same way. They don't blitz as often. They don't retweet their coverage as much. And I think that's really what the Ravens did well. I will say if I were, if I were, I think Steve Wilkes is their defensive coordinator now, right? Yeah. yeah. If there was one thing he should take, it's the late rotations, mm-hmm. whether that's the defensive line swapping spots, whether that's safeties, ignoring the Chiefs early motion in the snap and then waiting until later like that's the one thing I think you could do to kind of match what the Ravens did but I just don't know I don't know if the 49ers are ready for that so it might just be an entirely different type of defense that you see yeah and that was one of the things that uh you know I, I found out on Monday was I was looking I was like oh the, the Niners play 80 percent static coverage like they 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 play what they show like that seems like a bad idea against Patrick Mahomes like that doesn't seem like that's gonna work and it's going to be interesting to see how uh, Wilkes' defense does play. Now, this isn't the 49ers defense, I think, that we all think of when we think of a 49ers defense, right? It's not been the best one they've had in recent years. Yeah. They've still got some dudes on that front, and they'll cause them some problems. And again, Maddie, as you said, we'll dive into it for two weeks now. We get two weeks to dive into this matchup. Um, but I, I like the way that, uh, and, and I think in that question he addressed, he talks about the second half performance. Worries. Concerning, yeah. yeah. I don't think so. I think it was more of a, a more of a gear shift because I think Andy Reid and company knew, like, all right, the way we're playing right now, if we take care of the football, we'll be okay. Like, we'll be fine. So we don't necessarily need to press for these big plays. We don't need to press and, and impress other people, right? Like, we've got it. We're fine. If we get field goals, if we if we just move the ball, take some time off the clock, and just take care of it, our defense is playing so good right now that we're fine. And that's what it seemed like to me. Well, even though the rewatch, it seemed like they kind of just throttled down a little bit. Yeah. I don't think that they felt, I don't want to say like they, they weren't pressing or they weren't trying to win the game, but I don't feel like they, I don't think the offense felt like they had to do, they didn't right. have to score. They didn't yeah. feel like there was this need to score. It would be obviously if it was helpful, if it happened, I do think that concerning, but like the way, the fact that the offense completely sold out in the second half is something we've seen yeah. all year this season when things, when certain things don't go their way, they do struggle to move the ball. So, like, yeah, it's worth noting again that it happened, but also we've seen the offense do well versus the Dolphins, do well mm-hmm. versus the Bills in the second half. I think it was a little bit more of one, the Ravens defense is really good is. and did some good, nice stuff that, again, I don't think the Niners will replicate well. And they just didn't need to, they didn't need to make the play. They just had to not make the bad play. They didn't need to make the good play. And I do think that was a fundamental shift that they went through. All right, um, Craig is great. Uh, Grayson here is going, what is the impact of losing Charles O'Menehue for the Super Bowl and for next year? Pick for the Super Bowl. Yeah. I mean, I, George Karloftis is coming on. He's been very good as of late. He's getting better and better. I think George is very much a quality, high, you know, high quality starting defensive end. I still think that Charles O'Menehue provides more juice. He gives you another guy that can win quick off the opposite side to pair with Chris Jones. And then with George Karloftis, that gives you three rushers that you 
feel like can win a one-on-one. Yeah. And when you take Omenihu out, you're down to two and one of them in Karl Loftus. And he did have a great sack, a great rush in this last game. But he's a guy that usually wins a little slower. You mm-hmm. only Now you only really have the Blitz and Chris Jones that are going to kind of win in the two and a half second window that you want to win. Omenihu was the next guy to do that. So I do think missing him for the Super Bowl, that, that will matter. Now, is it going to matter a ton against the 49ers, this specific matchup? Right. I feel... It wouldn't matter if it was golf or party, but I'd feel worse if it was a super dynamic quarterback in the back of it was somebody that I think could really take over the game that you had to pressure to make to win the game. And I don't know if that's the 49ers, but I do think it will have a pretty big impact on the year. Like the Chiefs pass rush will have to manufacture some more stuff now. Outside of just like talent, right? Like uh, that's obviously a big hit in the talent department. Like just the bodies in that room. Like you're 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 starting to look at just the numbers wise of the roster construction. FAU was inactive for this this Ravens game. Probably gonna have to be active for the for the Super Bowl. Just based on the like the numbers, they're probably gonna have to bring up a, a defensive lineman from the practice squad. They might some people have thrown out Frank Clark signing. Let's go. Um look, I might be for it just to get another body in that room at this point. Uh but it, it's gonna be one of those things where uh, uh, the numbers in that room, and especially with uh, the way that the 49ers run their offense, it's gonna be um interesting to see the rotations there. Maybe Chris Jones does bump out and play a little bit more on the edge, but we'll have to see. But, Matty, before we get on to the next question, we're going to go ahead and take a break, um, and then we will get back to more of your questions on 21 Questions. We appreciate you supporting KC Sports Network by listening to our podcast. You have helped us become the highest-ranked Chiefs podcast network in 2022 and 2023. And don't forget about our daily Substack newsletter, the best written analysis you can find on the Chiefs straight to your inbox every day kcsn.substack.com Welcome back to 21 Questions here on KC Sports Network. Hanging out with Matty Lane, and we are answering your questions from the KCSN Discord. Matty, let's get back into it. All right. Next up, we got Z Andera. Sell him on Hollywood Brown as a free agent wide receiver. Pick up right now. It's kind of hard for me to get excited about that. Um, I'll start with this because I've, yeah. I've been a little big on the Hollywood Brown makes a lot of sense for the Chiefs for a while now. And it's, it's kind of simple. He's fast catches the ball, and he does more things than just be fast. He can run routes. He's a real wide receiver. He just happens to be small, but like he runs good routes. He gets open short, intermediate, deep. He's kind of exactly what the Chiefs are missing, and I get it. Hollywood Brown has not lived up to first-round hype. He has not lived up to being traded for a first-round pick hype. It's like right. it's twice, but what he does is valuable. He gets downfield. He stretches defenses. If you want to have him run a comeback, he can go do that and can go get open. He is essentially what Rookie year McCall Hardman was for the for the mm. Chiefs back then, but better because he could do more stuff than just running bitches. He fulfills a role the Chiefs don't have on this team right now. I don't think he's a wide receiver one. Right. I think he might even be like a high end wide receiver two, but maybe not even the top top top. And he's not T Higgins level, but he's not going to cost as much either. So yeah. I just think he makes a ton of sense for what this team is missing. This wide receiver room is relatively slow, right? Yeah. Especially with McCall Hardman kind of losing faith. Their fastest player is MVS, and he's just all build-up speed. And when's the last time MVS really just outpaced someone down the field? They need right. speed. Hollywood Brown provides that. I think he does more than just run deep, even if you know he's not, a, a, I guess, a complete wide receiver because his size does cause some issues. I do think you brought up an interesting point when you talk about Hollywood Brown and kind of the disappointment right with Hollywood Brown because of the first-round selection, the yeah. trading for the first-round pick. I think in this situation, if you're the Chiefs, if you're a Chiefs fan, you shouldn't have those, like, first round expectation right. on him and I think that that will make that move seem a lot better right because as you mentioned he's not going to be a wide receiver one he's he's has a, he has a specific role in this offense he has an itch he has an itch that will he'll scratch the Chiefs itch for what they want to do so I do think that you know between you and, and Kent and Craig and we we sat down and with with BJ and we watched some Hollywood round tape one of those nights too and uh, it's one of those things you can you can see him working really well in the Chiefs offense yeah, he's not perfect, but I mean, instead of paying a wide receiver, you know, you're not paying twenty plus million dollars for him. You're probably looking at fifteen to eighteen, right. which is a little yeah. bit less than what Christian Kirk got. And you look at people; they were ripping Christian Kirk for the Jags, and he's been very good for them. But I think it's like Hollywood Brown's kind of that same idea to me. Um, all right, no chicken tonight. What did you think of the Ravens um, and Terrell's like the how they use Terrell Suggs pregame, yeah. mid game for this particular playoff game? That was a really interesting choice because I, I think Kent during our live stream, our watch party, said like, is, "Is he wearing both of his Super Bowl rings?" Right. Uh, and Kent had even tweeted out a picture of Sherelle Suggs like in his 
in the Chiefs chain and the Super Bowl hat. It's, that's, I mean, I get he's a Ravens legend. No one's going to remember him as a Chiefs football player because a lot of people really don't. Except for some of the players on the field who won a Super Bowl with him. <laughs> no, that's fair. It is interesting. Um, he is a Ravens legend, though. Like, he, he, he was very good for that team. Um, and I understand he probably gets Ravens fans hired. Right, you hear Terrell Suggs is going to be there. You're going to get hyped if you're a Ravens fan. Um, but it is interesting that it did come down against the Chiefs, uh, and that was the other team he won a Super Bowl with. But uh, I don't know. I I feel I I get they they wanted to use him. They like almost in air quotes had to use him right to get yeah. uh, get the crowd hyped up. But just an awkward situation that I think they were just like, oh well, like we'll just we'll just eat this one, right? Well, yeah, because they had Ray Post like pregame for doing all the lead stuff, so, like they couldn't bring him out at that point. And so like, I, I, yeah, it was just interesting because yeah, any other team it would be perfectly fine, right? Any other team it works completely great against the Chiefs. It's just kind of like okay, like I guess, but <laughs> are Chiefs fans supposed to be upset that Terrell Suggs is out there? Like, do, no Chiefs fan is upset that he's only celebrating the Ravens. Everyone knows he's a Raven, like that's who he is. But he also helped the Chiefs win a Super Bowl. So like, cool, like we're here. I, I wonder if they thought it was like some kind of cool mind game where they're like, aha, we're going to celebrate this Super Bowl winner for the Chiefs and really get you guys because he's only going to care about us. But like, I don't know. Yeah. The Ravens were doing a whole lot all game. And I feel like I almost feel like they had to think that like this is some kind of got you moment. Like right. the Chiefs were going to care that Terrell Suggs wasn't on their side. Yeah, it was it was an interesting choice. They did have a lot going on for that game. I think they had like several pre pregame stuff. I mean, they had the T-Pain halftime show. They had all I kinds of more of that. Yeah, I didn't get to see any of that. Sadly, I love T Pain. The fact that it didn't hit social media or stick on there makes me wonder how that. Went. Oh yeah, that's true. I guess I didn't think about that. He's he's a Twitch streamer now though too. Oh, let's go. So check his Twitch. Um, <laughs> Lindsay Lou, I need y'all to look at the rule book and see if Justin Tucker was stretching in the wrong place to irritate Mahomes and Kelsey. Yes and no. There's no rule about him not getting to be there. Right. And I think Justin Tucker has stuck to the fact that he does this all the time. I think some people have pictures of him doing it from other games. That's what he does. Now, Justin Tucker has also said that every kicker does it. That seems like a lie because mm-hmm. no one's really backed him. I don't recall seeing this ever happening before. Right. So, like, I, I, I think this is what he does. But also, if you're Justin Tucker, like, I'm sorry, but, like, you can't be practicing right there where my team is trying to warm up like that's just not a lot if other teams let you okay that's cool but if my this is my half of the field to warm up on as the chiefs is my away team to warm up on you can't come over here messing around i get why are you not down by your team because you don't want to get in their way why do you get to come by my team to be in the way so like right. I, you know get over it i think i saw a league memo get actually sent out after that game about being more strict about teams warming up inside of the 45s um just to keep the 10 yards in between the 50 yard line yeah, you know, unoccupied as like a buffer zone. Uh, and I think that was sent out obviously after the Justin Tucker thing. Like, hey, you know, let's let's try to keep everybody with on their on their side of the field, which, you know, I, I'd seen some kickers do that before. I I don't know, like a ton off the top of my head, right? Like kickers just seem to kind of just do whatever they want and no one cares type of deal. It's like they're like only like one foot in on team rules because they're like one foot in on the sport. <laughs> <laughs> right. And according to Ross Tucker, they should just take them completely out. And I mean, yeah. It's one of those things, too, where it's like if they're, they were minding their own business, so you just like don't deal with them. But like this was like actively impeding with what the Chiefs wanted to do. Um, so that's a that's a, like a whole different story. But I, I think I saw that Justin Tucker said it was like all in good fun. And then the Chiefs were like, no, it wasn't. <laughs> well, I mean, Justin Tucker got up and talked and like I think he wanted to say it was all in good fun. But like you could tell that like he was also annoyed. And like at the end of it, he was just like, this is silly. And like, yeah, yeah it is, you know. Get over it, man. Go 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 to your side. Go mess with your quarterback. Oh, right. Yeah. Um, from Keith McLean. Can we should we give Frank Clark Shark a one game contract for the Super Bowl? I mean, like, yeah, if, if Frank Clark wants to come play for one game, absolutely I think you should. I don't know what kind of condition he is in. I don't no. know if he is ready to step in and play right away. But you know what? I'm about to make some people mad. If it's the difference between giving Frank Clark a whatever it takes for one game to come in and eat 10 snaps while the other guys play or giving FAU those 10 snaps, I might lean Frank Clark yeah. just for the simple fact that he's been there. He's played in these moments versus this exact team. I don't have to only kind of limit him to pass rushing snaps. I can mm-hmm. throw him out there and say, hey, can you give me 10 snaps versus the run? Can you give me five snaps versus the run? It's just... I feel like I have a little bit more trust in him, even though he hasn't been on the team all year since he's only kind of barely played this year. If it's just, if I'm only looking at a small number of snaps to give Karloff this, to give Dana, to give 
Malik Herring a little bit of time off, I almost trust Frank Clark a little bit more at this point. Yeah, I would agree with you. And I'm just trying to think of how that contract would work. Would they sign him to the practice squad so that they could elevate him yes. type of deal? Because uh, I don't think they'd send him to the active roster. Um, and I think that was kind of, if I had to make a prediction, I don't know this for a fact, obviously. I would think that's why he signed with Seattle, right? Because Seattle acted, offered him a 53-man roster contract. And I, yeah. I would assume the Chiefs were like, hey, you know, we'd love to have you, but like, Check here's a practice squad. Right. Here's a practice squad spot. And he didn't really want that. And I get that. I understand that. Um, but that's probably what it would be is a, a 53-man, or not a 53-man, but a practice squad call-up for him. And, and I agree with you. If he's just getting in there and eating 10 snaps, like, so somebody else can rest, like, that's mm-hmm. fine. Like, I feel like that's a very high floor at this point in his career um, type of move that you could you could have him in there. Hey, maybe he gets a sack, and maybe he, he maybe he gets even closer to that all-time postseason sack record uh, that, he's, right. that he's having. Raven, you want to tell me that Frank Clark, given two weeks to study the film, isn't going to come out and like not get got by some kind of misdirection right. or some of the Niners doing? It's so like, yeah, that's that's where I'm kind of leaning on with that. Um, and get the sack, get him another ring. Ooh, it'd be a lot of fun. Um, Azuri Gunner, is there any concern with the speed that the Niners have off of the edges with the delay coming from Creed Humphrey's poor snaps? Hmm, that's interesting. Um, uh, we watched some stuff uh, yesterday, Maddie, and we you talked about when. Uh, we've seen a recent trend at offensive line play with the karate chop up to the side, and people are like, hey, how come that's not a false start? Which, like, I understand, but the false start's in the hips. That's yep. what people got to realize about that. The false start's in the hips. The karate chop is so the, the so the center doesn't have to look underneath his legs, which Creed Humphrey does. Creed Humphrey looks underneath his legs, he gets back down in a squat, and then he'll snap it. Um, and we saw some stuff from the Ravens that took advantage of that. And he's specifically here talking about, like, the, the edge... Uh, when coming off of like low snaps, like Creed's had a lot of right. low snaps and Mahomes has to yeah. gather off the ground and the speed at which the Niners can get back there is I think the concern here. And so, and and, and I agree, like that that's a problem. And Donovan Smith played pretty well and Juwan Taylor played pretty well. <laughs> but those guys aren't Nick Bosa. Those guys aren't Chase Young. Those guys aren't name a edge rusher that they have, right? right. Like they've, they've got so many of those guys. So I think it's going to be probably something that they can do scheme-wise, schematically to try to get those guys not pinning their ears back to slow them down a little bit, make them think a little bit. Um, and, I, and I do think the timing is an issue, right, when it comes to Creed snaps and everything. We, we've seen this all year, really. A couple of low snaps, kind of some inopportune times. That messes a lot of things up. And, Maddie, what I thought was really interesting when we were sitting on the sidelines of the East-West Shrine Bowl, uh, we got to listen to a referee coach, an, an official coach, talk about, hey, like, what, what when this happens, you're looking for this type of call, and it's an illegal man downfield. And one of those things was uh, a timing thing with with a low snap, a bad snap. Then officials start to look for a legal man downfield. Uh, so I do think that that, that will be an, uh, something to watch for definitely with Creed as he, as he gets those snaps. But uh, with the edges specifically and the speed, Matthew, what, what do you think there? So the last time the Chiefs played Nick Bosa, the speed, similar mindset, they, they put him in hell. It gave him so much stuff to think about. He was wrong so many times just getting upfield. And Chase Young has never been very good at being right in these kind of situations. They are both very aggressive and get yeah. on the field. I wonder one Nick Bosa just being got so bad the last time. I do wonder if that causes him a little bit of pause. I do wonder if you get Chase Young once or twice, if that gives him boss like I, I think it's something to keep in mind, right? Like if there's a bad snap, those edge rushers, if they are really turning up in this game, you do got to figure out how to get the ball out quick. Yeah. But I just wonder if the 49ers are gonna play a little differently than normal just because of what has happened in the past. Mm-hmm. Like you go in, and the Lions did a great job too. They pinned and pulled a ton around the edges to take advantage of those, you know, aggressive DNs. And I know that's how they play, but we now have a game last week where they get beat because of it. They have a game against the Chiefs where they got beat because of the aggression. I just wonder if Andy Reid and this offense don't slow them down based on like scheme or mentality a little bit to where it's maybe not as big of a deal. We also got to get Creed to fix some snaps. Yeah. I, the yeah. other thing, and I, I haven't looked into it. I wonder if his games with the bad snaps come against teams that do a lot of adjustments. Like the Ravens, they put a lot of guys over him. They're dropping guys in and out. We talked about the play where he completely misses his man because his head's down and then they make a rotation. Then Mm -hmm. I'd have to go back and really look. But like if the 49ers are going to be mostly static and he's not concerned about having to scan, snap the ball, scan the field and everything together, is this going to be a game where we don't get many bad snaps because he's not worried about as much post-snap? I don't know. But um, next one from Christian Gumbinger. 
should the Chiefs do something different for the parade this year? Maybe like a different route or something else? I, I, I guess they should. They should let Tucker D. Franklin, D stands for Chug and Celtics and Bud Light, lead the parade through Kansas City. That's what it is. Uh, my thought is if it's not broke, don't fix it. You know, true. It's a pretty, it's a pretty good route. It's a pretty easy route. Um, it's always good that it culminates at a Union Station down there in Kansas City. Yep. I think Christian was even one that asked if, if it wasn't you, Christian. I'm sorry to whoever did ask it. He, if someone asked, like, oh, like excited for the Taylor Swift uh, pregame or pre parade show concert. Oh, I was like, that would be pretty sweet. I don't think Kansas City has the infrastructure to handle that. Uh, they do not, uh, because people would come from miles around. I mean, like, you thought people were in the trees that first time around. I'm going to be curious what the turnout would be for a Chiefs Super Bowl parade. This is going to be, like, the third one in back to back years. five years, back-to-back -back years. It's it, going to depend on the weather. It's so weather-dependent, right? I think, yeah. I think that if you got good weather, I think this one could look really good compared to, like, last year, because last year's the weather wasn't... It wasn't great, but it wasn't, like, the first... The first one was, like, frigid bone People didn't cold. care then, people though. People did not care. Yeah. Right. And I think last year, too, the weather wasn't great, so people were like, oh, I'll just wait for the next one. And it doesn't matter. You're going to have a lot more people show up just for the off chance that Taylor Swift is there or Absolutely. just even for the yeah, chance yeah. to see Travis Kelsey, who is dating Taylor Swift. Like, I mean, like, I yeah. don't want to make it about Taylor Swift. But, like, that's going to matter. It's, it's going to matter 100%. It's hard not to, just especially with her pop influence. Yeah. All right, we got Casey from Casey. Um, is FAU in the rotation in two weeks? I mean, yeah, I think he has to be active, yeah. right? And, like, even if they add Frank Clark, I think FAU should still be active. For sure. Right? Because, like, you're looking right now, this team's only got three defensive ends without Charles Ominihu, and that's Dana, you got Carl Loftus, and you got Malik Carey. Those are your guys that are playing, right? And, like, none of those guys have a lot of juice. That's not a lot. You lose Ominihu, who's your guy that you want to kick inside, so you're already losing these. I know Dana wants to kick inside, too, but you might can't kick him inside if he's always having to play outside, so they probably need at least one, if not two, defensive ends that haven't been active to be active to replace Ominihu. FAU... E.J. Thompson hasn't been active all year, but like this is an option for him maybe to get in there. Maybe they can pull somebody else. I don't know if they have another DN on the practice squad that has experience, you know, playing. But if not, that's a go get Frank Clark kind of situation. So there's moves. I do expect FAU to be active. But I just don't know how much in the rotation you'll get. Yeah, it's, it's a tricky situation. And that's what I brought up earlier with just in terms of the bodies in that room. You're running into a pretty, uh, pretty tough spot when it comes to just the guys in that room that are healthy and can play on the fifty-three man roster, you're already running into some pretty, uh, some pretty tough, tough matchups when it comes to the to the end room. Yeah, and like I said, if if you're gonna ever gonna be active, you probably need two to replace him. It's kind of has to be B.J. Thompson. The only other guys they have on the practice squad, I'm looking up here, are just a bunch of other young guys. I mean, Isaiah Bugs, he's more detackled, but like yeah. you could bring it up another big body. Truman Jones is another rookie who they haven't got in. I mean, oh, yeah. Maybe they just bring up Matt Dickerson too and just play with a bunch of bigger bodies and don't kick anyone inside and you just run with the four DNs. I guess that's a possibility. So I don't know. They they have some decisions to make there. Um, Hobo Joe, what's the most desperate need for this team that isn't being talked about? Oh, I got my answer, but if you can go first. No, I don't. I don't think I have one right now. A punter who doesn't choke in the playoffs and under pressure. Like I'm. Tommy Townsend's so good during the regular season, and when you ask him to just to boot the ball, he kills it. And when you ask him to throw a pass, he is great. But you get into the playoffs, and we're talking about hitting yardage, we're talking about flipping the field, we're talking about pinning the other team deep. I know he got one pinned down, but like he just had so many punts that didn't do what you needed them to do, number one, in this in this last game versus the Ravens. like The Chiefs could have pinned the Ravens a lot more with a couple good punts, or they could have set them up deeper in their own territory to make it easier for their offense, and he just... He seems to miss kick, not even just not have good punts, but he seems to miss kick a lot of balls in the playoffs. And this isn't a one game sample size. It seems to kind of happen every year. Yeah, I, I do think that it's becoming a concern uh, for sure for this team. And it only matters so much in the regular season, right? We've learned that with this, this Chiefs team. This Chiefs team specifically has taught us that the regular season only matters so much. It only matters enough to get you into the postseason. But I do think that that's that's a good one. No one really is talking about that, and it, it, it's hard to talk about to replace an All Pro punter, right? Like he won All Pro a season ago, um, but it has been an issue when it comes to the playoffs. I think his first punt was a like a thirty yard pun, and then his next one was only like forty five yards. Kicked one into the end zone, but he did pin one down uh, on on the one. But you would, I, I think, maybe Chiefs fans just spoiled by punter recently, 
or yeah. in, in the past. That's and, fair. But Dustin Colquitt has been one of the guys. I think it's probably the one when I started thinking through, that's probably the most in terms of his question, like well, the need that no one's yeah. talking about. I think that's the one. Okay, we got uh two more here. Corey Peter, what does your Super Bowl day routine look like? Because we've done it enough now that like, you know, we have yeah. to have a routine. Um yeah, so what's what's the Super Bowl routine? I'm not much of a uh, of a guy who is superstitious. Yep. Uh, I'm. You guys know that's too much of me to remember, right? Like I can't remember all that stuff. Um, so ne- I don't necessarily don't think I have a routine. I, even on like game days, I don't really have a routine. Just whatever I feel like doing, I'm gonna do. Actually, uh, Maddie, before the Dolphins game, I watched Twilight. <laughs> um. I don't know what to do with that. Yeah. They played pretty good against the Dolphins. But, uh, yeah, so there's, I don't really do anything habitually or ritualistically. I don't think I might have made that word up, but I don't do anything like that. I know that you have been wearing the same shirt. Yeah. For the whole, for the whole postseason run. I think you have to wear that shirt again. Of course. Um, but do you have any sort of routines for... No, no, I mean, well, so kind. I, I, it's for in every game, right? I, on the game, on game days, I like to work out in the morning. Um, you know, and like not only in one, I like to, to work out, so that's most mornings anyway. But like, I like it on football days because I'm not just. It gives me a chunk of the day where I'm not in any way, shape, or form thinking about the Chiefs, about sure. the player, or anything like that. I feel better after working out, so that leads me into you know eating and then hang out with the kids on the weekends, and get to hang out with the kids for a while. With the Super Bowl, it's late at night, so like you kind of get through the whole day, mm-hmm. but. There, there's only one other thing that matters, and that's, that's dressing up for Trophy Day. We got to get all the suits. We got to look real clean and fresh. This is something Craig Stout has started because it is popular in um, the wrong kind of football. And so we, we, Craig and I have been doing that since the Chiefs been doing these Super Bowls like that. That's on the list. It's kind of a workout. It's dressing up. I got to somehow incorporate the shirt that I've been wearing that the Chiefs haven't lost in with dressing up for Trophy Days. Like that's a new challenge this year, right? Mm-hmm. Like how do I wear the uh, the the Mahomes shirtsy? It's a shirt jersey there yep. with a suit going on at the same time. I haven't figured it out, but like that's about all we got. Um, yeah, tricky. Um, Grayson's got another good one here, so I didn't want to surf on one here. If you could pick one Niner to be inactive, who would you pick? Ooh, Rock Purdy. Oh man, you're gonna unleash Sam Darnold on us. I don't know if Sam Darnold can run that offense as well. Brock Purdy can. Brock Purdy got benched versus the Ravens. Many forget that is true. He did get benched versus the Ravens. Maybe that was a bad point. Maybe. No, no, no. I think that's fair because, like, then you're saying, like, "Hey, figure out a new quarterback in this moment, like, for one game." Like, I, I, that's that's a very reasonable idea. And so, when saying, "Hey, just get Nick Bosa off the field," just get Christian Christian McCaffrey's probably the one. Oh yeah, that's true. Because, like, would their offense still function? Yes, but they lose such a big element. You lose a lot of attention, but you also lose a guy that makes nothing out of something, right? So, like, I think <laughs> I think Christian McCaffrey would be my my big lean. Sneaky one though, Fred Warner. Um, because oh, yeah. that defense trying to get just set and do everything they need to do with Alfred Dre Greenlaw's great. I just don't know if he can step in and do what Fred Warner does. I think so much of that defense works because Fred Warner's one covers so much space in the middle of the field. He does so many of their calls. He understands so much. It's not so much just losing him. It's just how would the rest of the defense function once he's gone? Because everything about that defense is, hey, we have this super freak in the middle of the field that can do all this stuff we can play a different brand of football in all these other parts. So, like, you just remove him. Yeah, they can replace him with Greenlaw's mind and athleticism, and it's great. I just don't know if everybody else funnels in. So, like, there's some guys there that yeah. I, I think would be kind of fun, but I think that wraps it up. I think that's one definitely 21 questions on the dot. No doubt about it. Yep. Don't even try to count them. That was 21. Uh, we appreciate you guys listening all the way to the very end of the podcast. Final podcast for us here. At the uh, the KCS in Wisconsin house in Frisco, Texas. So, uh, Chiefs going to the Super Bowl. Don't know if you heard that. Chiefs going to the Super Bowl to play the uh, Yeah, again. They'll also again play the San Francisco 49ers. Um, in a year that is a leap year. I don't know if you know that. And also an election year. So it's a lot of similarities between the two games. Um, we will make sure that you are covered with everything that you need to know leading up to the Super Bowl. We got a couple weeks before the game. But we. Got you covered at KC Sports Network. Make sure to like the video if you're watching on YouTube. Make sure to hit that subscribe button for more Chiefs content. Also, leave us a five-star rating and review wherever you listen to your podcast. Those always do help out. I believe that uh, as we sit here today, Maddie, as we're recording this podcast, uh, 
uh, KC Sports Network was a top 100 uh, podcast in sports nice. on the Apple Podcast charts. So That's impressive because some people were not happy that I picked the Bills. Some people were not happy that you picked the Bills. And people will still continue to remind you that you picked the Bills, even when the, I, I guarantee you, Maddie, that when we are on our post game show for the Super Bowl, someone will let you know that you picked the Bills. Just give me the praise, too. No, I've set them on, I set the Chiefs on this path. The first question asked who was responsible. It was me. I did it. There you go. That's going to do it for us. We appreciate you listening all the way to the very end. Uh, for Matt Lane, I'm Tucker Franklin. We'll catch you guys next time. 49ers are sad. <laughs>